Welcome one and all to the No Name Cinema Society, the online review show that does a deep dive on these movies. It is Thursday, September 13th, 2018. We are kicking off our 52nd series of episodes tonight as we always start with a current release. And tonight it's gonna be Pierre Morel's film, Peppermint, which just came to theaters this past Friday. Hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here this evening. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we're reviewing the film Peppermint tonight. And uh, one of our co-hosts is uh, Humphrey Bogart here is gonna be joining us for the conversation. He might not have a lot to say about the film, but I bet you a couple of people that uh, do, have, do have a lot to say includes uh, the old standby, ladies and gentlemen, the hyper-violent, power-obsessed drug dealer, Drunk Davey is here. How you doing? Also with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a soft-spoken vigilante suffering from extreme PTSD. Ryan Turner is back. What's up, everyone? Let's talk about our 52nd series of episodes. Here's the schedule right now in front of you for our 52nd series of episodes, which starts tonight, Thursday, September 13th, with this review of Peppermint. We're back on Monday with our Indie Spotlight, and we're going to look at Much Ado About Nothing, as directed by Joss Whedon. And a week from tonight, Thursday, September 20th, we do our classic movie discussion. We're going to go back to 1942, where I make Davy watch Orson Welles' The Magnificent Ambersons, one of our big films from our 1942 review last year. Finally, our sound off, our freeform segment, will be on Monday, September 24th, in which we're going to bring back popular segments like the movie game, the character actor segment that we call What's Their Bucket, and my top five is going to be the top five adaptations of Pulitzer Prize winners. Are you guys ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And it's time for us, uh, to, for me to do the summary of Batman. I mean, Peppermint. Auto mechanic Chris North is approached to be a driver in a heist that would rob a local drug dealer. Chris turns down the job, but it's too late. Word had already gotten around to the drug dealer, who sends a message by gunning down Chris North and his daughter right in front of his wife, Riley. Riley's able to identify the shooters, but the drug dealer has the whole system in his deep pockets, and they all get off free. Riley North then disappears, but returns to Los Angeles five years later, a new woman set to single-mindedly exact her own kind of revenge on the drug dealer's whole organization. Let's get right into opening thoughts, uh, a sentence to to describe how you feel about the movie, the basic thoughts, um, and the master of it is Drunk Davey. Davey, why don't you tell us what you thought about Peppermint? Uh, well, at least it's not a long movie. Okay, that's his opening thought. Now we turn to Ryan, and uh, we saw the movie together, but we did not say a word to each other about it. Ryan, what'd you think of Peppermint? Generic action movie perfect that's even better than davy with the opening <laughs> thoughts i loved it all members of society should watch that that's how it's done maybe even he could, could have you know had less beats in between each word but still uh it was it was well done opening thought and my opening thought is going to be the kindest it seems uh because i do love jennifer garner kicking ass and that uh and that's my opening thought. And that's where we'll start uh, with the discussion is with the direction and specifically the action. Now, I think David Leach has surpassed Morell as an action director. The film is hardly as good as Atomic Blonde. However, the action scenes are still as exhilarating to me as they are in Taken. Smart, quick, well choreographed, and functional within the story. I mean, I think sometimes they tested the limits of Patrick scale of believability. Those of you fans of the show know what I'm talking about, but it never fully crossed that line for me. It, everything seemed to fit within the world Morel had created. Ryan, did you at least like the action? I, I thought it was well done. Like, I don't think there was any necessarily gaping flaws in the action. I may be spoiled with something like Mission Impossible Fallout, which was just absolutely jaw-dropping. So it's like, if you're going to be doing fight scenes, uh, it, it, it seems... It seen or like in it or John Wick. It's like if you're gonna be doing gun fights, it's like John Wick's the kind of precedent for that. If you're doing big set pieces, it's obviously not the budget. But then there's movies like The Raid or other ones that I think really do revenge movies. That's the bar for me is like movies like The Raid action sequences, which literally leave you breathless. I feel like um, there was cool scenes. The Pinata Factory was kind of cool. I don't think there's necessarily any flaws with the action itself. I didn't leave it going wow. That was amazing. John Wick is the same director as Atomic Blonde, David Leach, that I mentioned earlier. I agree with you in terms of David Leach's ability to direct action, although I, John Wick was the worst movie I saw in 2014, I think it was. The action in those films worked within the spirit and world of those films, and I feel like the action in this film worked within the spirit and world of this film. John Wick, for example, was very heightened, Atomic Blonde, very heightened and stylized, and so that action worked there. 
this was not necessarily super grounded, like it wasn't absolute verisimilitude, but it was a little closer on that end, and the action followed suit, I think. I don't think they could have gotten away with John Wick style scenes in this. It would have been a different kind of movie. Taken, the same thing. Like, this is closer to Taken in that regard. Taken had some great action, but not as flashy or stylized as John Wick, for example. This was pretty generic. I know I hate to steal your word, but it was so on the money, Ryan. It was mundane, not memorable at all. There wasn't a lot of variety in her kills. It's cool to shoot somebody in the face. I mean, don't get me wrong, but... uh. How many times are you going to go to that well, you know? I bought it all. It didn't bump for me in that regard. And you guys do seem spoiled. And we reviewed Mission Impossible on this particular show, and we all liked it. And that's another one where that action worked within its own stylization. This was grittier kind of action, and I liked them both separately. I don't even think I can compare the two. Action-wise, they both work. Yeah, I agree that they're more or less different genres of action. The better comparison would be something like, uh, uh, you know, like, like the killer, hard boiled. Hold on, John Wick is his own John separate Wick. kind of stylization. I don't know if that works either. But, I, but, but they're shooters. They're shooters. John Wick is slow motion opera kind of stuff. The only real fair comparison I think is Taken because that's the or one definitely. that seems to work mostly within this world. It's the one person versus many, is what I'm saying. So like, I do think there is a lot of even though there are stylized violence, like something like the raid, which is literally she's going into factories of gangsters and shooting them all. And, like, the raid is guy going off in the gangs- uh, factories of, like, whatever, pe- people in this building, and then he's killing them all. Maybe Judge Dredd is a better sample, too. But Judge Dredd's a comic book. Doesn't that Judge Dredd also take place in the future? I mean, you're saying it's grounded, but to me, it's one person versus many. That's the umbrella that I put it underneath. Massive difference between John Wick and Peppermint. Yeah, I agree. I think it would have been groundbreaking if it was, like, the 80s. It just seemed like not anything special like today. It seems like it's just she's a female Punisher. Punisher is a good... That works a little better for me in terms of comparisons. Certainly the action in this film is better than any Punisher movie that's come out. No, uh, Warzone, much better. Oh, I disagree. I hated that passionately. One thing about Morel, though, is I think he had some really terrific shot choices. Um, The moving camera in particular was used very well, particularly when he had reveals. The reveal of the three men hanging from the Ferris wheel, the reveal of the mural in Skid Row, that particular thing gave me goosebumps. Additionally, I really liked his use of the little girl that had passed, Carly, I think her name was, as a motivator for the slightly off Jennifer Garner character. The things that I didn't like about it was shaky camera work to suggest issues with her mental state. Garner was doing just fine communicating that without the shaky camera. That felt a little forced to me. Davey, anything about the shot choices? I was hoping for something at least memorable. I didn't really get anything. I struggled for from the beginning with this. It seemed uninspired and bland. Nothing really sticks out to me. It sounds like to me, like this movie needed to have something that you've never seen before or it's no good. It can't just work on its own terms. I have a litany of issues that I can get into later. It needs to be something interesting. I don't need groundbreaking. I just need compelling. And I didn't get any of that. We will get into the screenplay because I was compelled the whole time, uh, yeah. without a doubt. Ryan, anything about the shot choices? Yeah, I mean, I remember, uh, I think that's particular one with the Ferris wheel was interesting uh like that one stuck out to me um i do agree that some of the camera work was interesting i don't necessarily have any problems i pretty much agree with what you said jb like the shaky the twitch effect is literally a video co-pilot plugin that they were using it felt very cheesy my flaws come with the basis of the story the parts that i didn't like about it are similar to my issues with taken taken might have been a perfect movie had it not been for the opening and closing character driven segments and the same is true here Morel just cannot seem to handle anything that's character-driven and not action-related. Um, the flashback element, which is, uh, I don't want to say the first third of the film, but maybe the first quarter, is student film level bad. Um, Morel continues to be completely unable to get any sense of verisimilitude in character re- development. With these scenes, when there's no acting and it's just story, the blocking, the acting, the shots, nothing feels right. It's almost as if it bores him and he's just trying to get through it instead of using it to justify his character for the rest of the movie. There's no shades of gray in his handling of the scenes, just broad strokes to get across the most basic ideas. I blame him instead of the screenplay because it's a consistent problem in his films, and I didn't find anything wrong with the scenes themselves as written. Screenplay is next, but before we get to that, I do want to talk about Morel's handling of the flashbacks and how different they are from the rest of the movie. Anything from you, Ryan? The one bright spot of the flashbacks to me is that little girl who I thought knocked it out of the park. She was just adorable. I agree she was adorable. I had a hard time believing she was like a three-dimensional character. I really don't blame her for that at all. Her husband's just a very generic, forgettable dude. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. He was a pretty boy kind of face. He felt hallmarky. <laughs> 
how Alex works on a lot of those movies. I won't tell him you said that. In Taken, they took a random girl. It turns out her dad's this absolute trained badass that like takes the world out. And that's cool. Like that's a good premise. This one, it's like, I was really curious what they were going to do with those flashbacks to kind of show, okay, they messed with the wrong mom, I guess. Like, but she's just like not, you know, she didn't punch the mom. She didn't, she should have. And then like, you know, it's like all these things, none of it lined up, I think, to really point to, okay, this is how we got to this final thing. That was the one job of it. I bought the premise, but I agree that it was badly handled. When we talk about screenplay, I've got a pitch for you guys about how to improve it. Davey, tell me about the flashbacks in terms of direction. The scenes, you're right, they're so bad. Any scene pre-murder of family, they're so terrible. He just is so bored with the idea of setting up the characters that he just skips steps. The conversation between the police officer and his partner, where he's like, you know, you gotta put your game face on, and it, there's nothing wrong with his face. Like, he's not reacting <laughs> at all. I don't think that's what he meant. Anything that would require any kind of work to, to set up any part of the story, he just glossed over it, and, and it was it was just awful. I often said about Taken, I wish he just let me handle the front and the end of the movie. You can have everything <laughs> in the middle. I'll just do it. I'll do it for you for free, Pierre. Like, let me just handle the character stuff, and you take the rest. Honestly, you're so good at the action. I'm fine co-directing with you. Your movie would be so much better if you let me do it. Well, we should get a hold of him. So let's do that. Maybe he'll watch. And he'll know for his next movie if he gets to make another one. Here we go with the screenplay. And so my biggest issue with the screenplay is the structure. I mean, the flashbacks themselves are my biggest problem. Here's my pitch to you guys. I don't see them as necessary at all. Imagine the movie begins with three separate murders by a mysterious figure. We don't see her fully. Then credits. And then the movie opens at the three guys hanging from the Ferris wheel. This creates a certain amount of mystery surrounding Peppermint. The presence of the police and FBI create a scenario where they could peel away at the backstory like an onion revealing detail by detail of how she became a vigilante badass, keeping us engaged and compelled instead of throwing it all at us at once. Let us do some of that detective work as well. Um, like most screenwriters, they needed to trust the audience more to, to be willing and able to do some of that work. I, I think it would have been much more interesting and compelling. And Ryan, I think you would have bought it more because I think your issue is seeing the soccer mom and then the vigilante badass and not seeing the in-between. If you just met the vigilante badass and found out she was a soccer mom later on without ever seeing it, I think you might have bought it more. He skips over the parts that we want to see, which is like that. How did she get from point A to point Z? I know you said that's a new pitch is like, don't show that at all, which maybe is a solution. But if you are going to show the flashbacks, you have to show that transformation, which they showed through like some kind of weird, oh, she's in a fight club here. <laughs> the YouTube video. The three people up in the Ferris wheel. They're like the people that actually she wanted revenge on, and we skip over that. Those are the three people that would have been very cathartic to see, like, her getting. That's how I wanted to start the movie, with all three of them. She becomes, in my opinion, very unlikable. Yeah, that mom was kind of a douche with the Girl Scout cookies, but then she's like, makes her piss herself and punches her in the face. It's like, what? I don't necessarily like rooting for her. That's part of what I liked about it, to be honest. I kind of like the gray area, and we'll get to that when we get to the T word. Davey, how do you like my pitch? I mean, it's definitely an improvement. Um, it's definitely an improvement. I, I, I would have liked to have seen that. I, you know, um, well, just imagine the flashbacks are gone. You get straight to the action, and then you have the, we, along with the investigators, find out how she became that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if if you're if we're not going to go with your way, I'm owed a montage at the very least, not just a YouTube clip. I want to like come to these conclusions on my own. Like, I, I think even if they did the montage in this iteration, that also would have felt didactic you know i mean i i i want to i want them to insinuate and not necessarily give us everything on a silver platter you mean when they sit in the room there and the fbi agent uh breaks the news that she like broke she robbed the bank like that night and they they never heard about it the victim in your crime i didn't think about that but i also don't have a rebuttal for it i suppose that makes sense and it's unusual uh, that you would do that. Um, so now we get to the plot itself, um, which I guess we were sort of hinting on. Uh, in general, it's not terribly original. I acknowledge that. But I was engaged just enough, largely due to the action scenes. I really love the sense that Peppermint was doing more than exacting revenge. I love the fact that Skid Row was suddenly the safest area in the city. I love that scene with the drunk father. I liked elements of this, understanding that this revenge tale is not original. And she is the female Batman, as far as I can tell, just not a well-off one like Bruce Wayne. So I liked that she was not just avenging her family, she was defending the helpless. I think that you're right about the drunken father scene. She showed a willingness to help out the people in Skid Row. I mean, it didn't seem like it was motivation of any sort. But I think it would be in the sequel. 
Um, but I, I, I don't think it was like she obviously had something else on her mind. But I mean, like if it fit into her schedule, she would, <laughs> she would take care of it. <laughs> um, Ryan, fair. that's fair. You, you already called it generic, so it sounds like you agree with me there. Some of these good qualities of the script. I mean, it was interesting to set it in Skid Row. Like, I will give it that. That was an interesting choice. Um, again, like, the interesting stuff that would have been is seeing how, you know, there's this mysterious... I think, yeah, like, what you're saying, if they went in your direction where she's just this mysterious person and we have, like, hints of it, she's almost like a folk figure. Uh, but her mythos is busted in that flashback stuff, so we know who she is. And if you're going to show who she was... You're not gonna immediately jump from that to mural on the wall like that. I, I'm like, what? Well, that seems like the stupidest mural ever. Like, what has she done to earn that? We haven't seen any of that. Like, why would they be mural? Like, all she's done is like blow up a judge. It'd be cool to see her become the crime boss of Skid Row or something. You know what I mean? Like, that's interesting. Like, not the crime boss. See her interact with the people and the locals and like the that initial in, like her kind of supplanting there and like being at the low and you know, open up the world to show like how, what it's like to live on Skid Row and all that stuff. But no, she has a van on Skid Row, people painted a mural for it, which seemed like all of the things she did were outside of Skid Row anyways. Like, it's not like she was saving people. Well, no, that whole thing is they had that scene, suddenly Skid Row was the safest place of the city and that's what led them to her. Right, it's a convenient thing to write in a script, yeah. but like, that's a tell not show. That's a super interesting element that you're not even going to dabble into. You're just going to be like, oh, by the way, she made Skid Row the safest place in the city. You're, you're right. You get the sense that it's plausible that she would, given her defending of the kid from the drunken father and that sort of thing. So you get the impression that she would defend it as needed and she had earned the mural. But you're right. We don't see a ton of it. And that's the balance of what to show and what not. They would have had more time if they cut the flashbacks. Well, I mean, they had plenty of time. I mean, the movie's not particularly long anyway. That's true. But you have to be careful. I mean, because it is about the revenge of the family. So... You know, the, yeah. the, the, the uh, uh, aside with the drunken father is 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 a sidetrack, but it's it it's short enough that you it, that it's justifiable and you just get past it. If you have too many of those, that's when it starts to feel like the movie doesn't have momentum. I feel like you have to be careful about that. And that's what I mean by the time they would have had time for maybe another aside or two if uh if they hadn't had all those flashbacks in there. I guess we don't see exactly eye to eye on this, but mostly it sounds like. Um, the one thing I will say though, uh, is there's a twist uh, three quarters of the way through that I was genuinely surprised by. And it was a huge twist and it wasn't done in a cheap way. And we won't reveal what it is. In hindsight, it all tracked and that's very difficult to do. We see enough movies that, uh, that, uh, are t that have a hard time fooling us, but they really got me with this one. I, I was genuinely surprised by the twist and I, it made me like the movie a little more. I kind of disagree in the fact that it, 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 to me, it felt like being like, what would, I mean, it felt, it did feel cheap to me. I'll just say that. It felt like what we're going to do to like surprise people. You can't disagree that it fooled me because it did. Like I didn't oh, see it coming. Sure. It fooled me too. Like I thought it was an interesting twist. I don't think it fooled me in a way that was like, oh, I should have seen that coming. I would argue that zero percent of audience would see that coming because it was clearly a twist that was just like two people in a writer's room being like what wouldn't people expect you know things well, happen in the first <laughs> act that i think undervalue the twist like if you go back and watch it again i, I don't, don't count the flashback, but i don't know for sure because we need to watch it again but when it comes out on video we'll do that and see it seemed to track with everything in the first act and especially if you look at it again i think it it might um but but you know we'll 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 have to think about that again. But I, like, specifically, you just talking about the flashbacks, the behavior in the flashbacks? That, no, that, not you know? I guess it would be the flashbacks, yeah. Like, the, the, the five years before or whatever. I just think there were certain things within that. I, I think if we went back on it, we would see that it, it, it's there, but it's, it's, it's definitely subtle. Um, but I, I buy it. David, it probably didn't fool you. No, it did. Well, it did fool me up until the five minutes, uh, it might, might not have been like two minutes before it happened when they told us it was going to happen. That's what I knew as well. But that That's that to me is the reveal. Yeah, I mean, but that to me, it would have been way cooler for the reveal to be the the shocking thing. Instead of having it hinted at by someone yeah. before that, you just want to see it. It would have been way better to have. I wonder what it would have been like to see it if that would have been cheap. I have to think about that. At least I was given like a minute or two to get used to the idea. It might have been handled just right. It 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 fooled me and, and got me well, really interested in the movie. You could have done it out of order. Have the thing happen 
and then that conversation happens and then you can see the guy put it together or something in his head the big thing that I, that I think you're referring to is the big thing we're trying to be very vague here ladies and gentlemen <laughs> the big thing that i think happens that if we didn't get that hint it might have been too shocking but it might have felt more out of left field it's all a delicate balance ryan you're an editor little choices like that have a big effect especially when you're talking about a twist like that i think they successfully accomplished a twist like it reminds me of the guy Richie sherlock holmes when there's a twist and then they show you a bunch of close-ups and you're like how did you not get this and you're like no one's gonna get that not a single yeah. person is gonna watch this movie and be like i predict this twist because they're not giving you any breadcrumbs which means yeah. therefore it's not like an earned twist that was certainly not my least favorite part in the movie i'm not like completely hating on this twist. i thought that it was surprising and it was just the more i thought about it the more i kind of like turned against it i guess the last thing i want to say about the screenplay is Without revealing the ending, I do want to talk about it uh, in the sense that I do feel like the ending was a cop-out on many levels. I see why they did it. It seems like something that came out of focus group screenings. It, it seemed like it was prepared to end a certain way, and then they needed to tack something on to, uh, to end a, uh, a different way. I think the film would have been more powerful and in keeping with one of the potential themes if they did go a little bit darker. So I was disappointed with the very ending. I am disappointed with the ending as well. I, it's a little little different. It kind of fits into one, one of my overall gripes with the movie. We haven't covered your overall gripes with the movie yet? Oh, all the oh God, no. Oh, <laughs> God, no. Okay, well, I guess we'll do that next because I was just about to segue the <laughs> T-word, Ryan. So here's the thing. One thing I actually really liked that they did was uh, they had in the beginning in the flashbacks they, these like ominous – the ominous idea that this cartel's reach is unfathomable. Like, it's it, it's everywhere. And I actually really liked that idea that it was kind of spread so deeply that, like, you know, if you start to mess with this, then it's, like, it's beyond your comprehension. Like, that's – because that's really probably more honestly what it is at this phase. If you start messing with the cartel, you're pretty much dead. Like, that's a fact of life. Um, they're not going to – it's not – the government can't save you. Like, no one's going to save you. So I feel like – that was interesting. And then everything in the third act kind of devalued that. One of the most interesting scenes was when they kind of raised the stakes for the villain, saying, like, there's more at stake here than just this. And, like, I thought that was one of the better scenes in the movie. See, it's hinting at this bigger thing, but it never paid off. I think that's purposeful, and that's part of this cop-out, because I do think in their minds they want to keep the option for some sort of follow-up. I'm just spoiled from seeing the way shows like Breaking Bad kind of depict that underworld in a very grounded yet earned way it feels like this didn't feel earned this feel like caricatures it just felt like almost racial stereotypes in a lot of ways and i get that there are mexican gangs i am going to talk about that i was going to skip performances short on time and go straight to the t-word because the t-word i think is big tonight you said we haven't even got to what your major issue with the movie is so now's the time before we go right. to the t-word yeah. we'll start with the small stuff um basic problems with the script um to the point where um, you know, they're, they're trying to get this guy to join in a, uh, uh in, in a robbery. And, uh, he says, don't you want to get that home for your daughter? Cut to their beautiful house. I mean, I, I lumped that in with the, like everything about the flashbacks was like, wrong. I mean, I, like yeah. I, I had that thought about the house too. Why not put them in an apartment with like, you know, that you can tell they're trying to make it nice, but there's a leak and some bugs and they're doing the best they can, but it's struggle street. Even more interesting, put her in Skid Row or something. That would have been too did. much, I think. Uh, but I, I do think that it, uh, it was, the house was definitely over-decorated. I noticed that as well. Like there was way too much stuff going and it, on. It was, and it was, it was just too big and it was in a nice neighborhood and, and they both had cars. And he, by the way, owned a business of a garage and like, it was just, just, wildly dumb i think that the whole savior thing that was all wedged in to try and cut the racism a bit there's no build-up to that stuff it's just a sentence like oh crime has dropped here because she's helping the people i think that they needed to figure out a way to make this thing a little more palatable i disagree with that vehemently it takes place enough in the second half of the script that it would be impossible to wedge that in like it's a large part of the movie it's hardly something that is added they didn't like throw together an angel mural for a reshoot no 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 no. i don't think it's a reshoot i i, I think it's just, someone looked at the script and they were like look at man we gotta we gotta we gotta have something here like there's no this is not gonna work um 
and it didn't work because it does it just doesn't none of it fits there's no build to any of that it's just thrown in there with a sentence i disagree especially because there's a number of periods where i mean with the way the kids are looking at her skid row early on from her handling with the drunk father i think it's all it's all there if you're going to tackle something with the complexity of the of the drug war um there's i don't have any problem with with just glossing over things and just having it be a totally superficial level and not go into any of the complexities if you're going to have it be so specific to a specific type of people then you owe it to you know the people who are are watching this to to go into some explanation some backstory as to how somebody ended up in the position they were in how these things get the way they are if you want to talk about racism, that's one of the T words. So let's let's right, let's right. that brings us to the T word. The T word is themes. Davey doesn't like to talk about themes, so we disguise it. We trick him by calling it the T word, and he has no idea. He wants to talk about racism, and that was my second theme. So I'll jump to that. I think it's a secondary theme. I disagree that the film is racist. I do think that the trail of the film had people up in arms with the idea of a white person taking down Hispanic criminals. And certainly in Trump's America, it might be irresponsible to cast Hispanic Americans in that light when they are so shamefully under fire from the powers that be. My hope is the twist of the movie helps that out a little bit without giving too much away. And even if it doesn't, it is entirely plausible and logical for drug dealers in Los Angeles to be of Hispanic descent, especially given that most of the drug supply comes from South America. It's unfortunate that that's the case, and the film could have perhaps examined the socioeconomic conditions that lead to the life of crime for low-income minorities in urban areas, maybe through one of the kids in Skid Row that tempted to join the cartel in some way, shape, or form. But my larger question is this. Doesn't the strong feminist message get buried in the film's alleged racism? I joked about it earlier, but Peppermint is a female Batman, and she takes the power back. Her methods may be questionable, and that's part of my other theme, but it can't be denied that as a woman, she was not going to let the world of men push her around anymore. And in that, she's as much a feminist hero as Charlize Theron in Atomic Blonde, or even Anne Hathaway in last year's Colossal. Davey? That's my response to your claims of racism. I don't disagree with any of that. I think it's irresponsible. Uh, I do think it's a strong feminist movie. I'll give you that. There are Mexican gangs. It just felt tone deaf in a very highly politicized place that is America has now become. If you're a studio and you're putting out a movie like this, you know what you're doing. You know who you made the bad guy. You choose to tell this story, so it just felt like they played into it. I agree that the twist was like a uh, like a, a olive branch attempt. Um, I don't know if it was enough to like fully do that, uh, but I, I didn't, I didn't walk away. Yeah, I, I, I was just like, okay, it, it, it just didn't, it felt like a movie that would have been in the 90s, maybe at the step forward. This seems like it's just like, okay, you guys aren't aware of, you had this movie in your slate, you made it, and now you have to release it, and it's not the best time to release it. The movie was even five years ago, Barack Obama's president. Is this, is, is it still racist? Yeah. And again, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think so. I think they're caricatures. They're not three-dimensional people. They're this caricature of gangsters. Uh, the other theme that I had, guys, was uh, the judicial process itself. Now, the film certainly suggests the failure and corruptibility of the system. This would have worked a lot better, I think, if she had exposed the judge and DA instead of, or really in addition to, killing them. Which brings us to the second tier of this theme, the complicated relationship the film has with vigilantism. Characters, including Jennifer Garner, are always saying how the use of violence brings us down to the level of the bad guys. So the film seems very aware of this, and yet it has a hard time not condoning Garner's behavior, supported by the ending that I felt should have been darker. All of this is to suggest the failure of the current justice system, from cops to lawyers to judges, all the way around to keep the streets safe. My guess is the film wants reform in lieu of vigilantes, but it never takes the time to go so far to suggest that. It does do a good job, though, I feel like, in starting the conversation. I thought that was an interesting element. Like, I talked about that kind of earlier scene in the courtroom. I thought that was one of the more interesting elements was this kind of looming presence where the tentacles had spread all over. Again, that, and that's where I bumped was her means of dealing with it seemed very over the top and didn't even seem like that was going to be the full solution. It just seemed like this... You cut off one head there's going to be two more that grow you know what i mean if you if you're not i, I think there's been more cathartic uh endings uh, especially watching the tv show narcos how dirty money can get into the judges and the, the police um even in our own country i thought that was interesting but i i, I agree with you that didn't really feel like it fully paid off in any way 
Fair enough. All right, guys, we're running along, so I'm just going to close things out. Um, thanks very much for being a part of the, the show tonight. Our next current feature is going to be in mid-October, probably. We're going to do A Star is Born. I saw it a year ago, so it'll be interesting to see how my impression of it a year ago in, in an early form compares to what the other guys have to say. Our next show, however, is this Monday, September the 17th, in which we do the indie spotlight, Much Ado About Nothing, as directed by Joss Whedon. We're going to talk about that this Monday, September 17th. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned.